Let me introduce Megan and her here a few things. Megan did her PhD in the Arizona University and her advisor was a famous Natalie Smith. And she was working with Nathan for um, a long, long time. After this, she did three postdocs, I mean, in different parts. The first one, was, she was Diane B. Magulauri Fellow in the Michigan University. After this, she was rooted for International and Maria Curie Fellow in Edinburgh. And finally, she was a uh, ESO Fellow, no, that is in Germany, in Garkin, that she's now. And after this, I mean, after this summer, probably, she will be assistant professor at the Rhine University in Texas, no, and she's now getting a job in this, there in, in USA, and she's coming with us to give a talk about this fantastic work in different things, and also in Karina Nebula, no, that I am really interested, and she can now start. Thank you, Megan, for this talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. Um, thank you for everybody for joining us in this uh, interesting virtual slash hybrid world. Um, so again, yeah, um, Megan Ryder, and I'm very interested in uh, what I've been calling the role of ecology in star and planet formation. So I've really been thinking a lot about um, how kind of the birth environment of star and planet systems really affects the outcome of star and planet formation. And part of what got me interested uh, in this particular topic is because over the course of my career, there's been a real explosion in the number of known extrasolar planets. Um, but as of today, there's still only one planet that we know of that hosts life. And of course, that's the Earth. Uh, and because it's, you know, our sample size of one, in many ways, the Earth is still kind of a template of what we think we might be looking for in terms of habitable, uh, features of habitable planets that we might find orbiting around other stars. The presence of liquid water on the surface, a biochemistry that's built on some of the most abundant elements uh, of the universe. Um, but I think one of the uh, other important things that we have seen with this explosion of the number of known extrasolar planets is that we should be very cautious about taking the solar system as um, maybe the best and only template for what the outcome of planet formation might look like. So if we just look um, at a relatively recent census of the known extrasolar planets, looking at planet mass here on the y-axis and the separation from the um, host star in orbital period here on the x-axis, uh, comparing the known extrasolar planets to the planets of the solar system, we can see that these are pretty different populations. And there are a couple of good reasons for this. Um, it's certainly going to be easier to detect a larger planet. Um, it's, uh, depending on your detection method, going to be easier to see it if it's very close or very far from the star. So there's some real technical challenges to moving towards the lower right-hand portion of this plot. Um, but nevertheless, I think this demonstrates that there's an incredible diversity that comes out of the planet formation process. Uh, and so the question is, what are the relevant factors that create this diversity? So my particular approach to this problem is not to go look for the planet forming systems themselves, but to take a step back and look um, at the star forming environment itself and try and figure out how that affects star and planet formation and how that might lead to the diversity that we see in uh, plots just like this. So I would argue this incredible image of HL Tal from Alma in some ways has become the picture of planet formation. And I'd like to argue uh, today that we should perhaps include the star forming environment in sort of this picture of planet formation. Uh, and I'd like to argue that there are kind of three main ways in which the larger star forming environment can affect the outcome of planet formation. So depending on how um, other stars in particular in the environment affect this planet forming disk, that's gonna affect the time scale that you have available to make planets. Depending on what the radiation does to say the chemistry in the gas or the, um, how the nucleosynthetic products of these uh, high mass stars get mixed in with the star forming gas will affect the ingredients that are available for making your planets. And I think people are particularly interested in how this might affect terrestrial or Earth-like planets. Um, and I'm finally, I'm interested in how if we consider an ecosystem, so not just one star and planet forming system, but um, a star forming environment, a star forming cluster, how the ecosystem itself um, regulates the outcome uh, of these first two things and ultimately the demographics of planet forming systems. 
so uh, just to be clear, I'm going to talk in broad brushstrokes in this talk, um, just about low mass stars and high mass stars. Uh, we know that the universe, of course, makes stars in a broad range of masses, um, but my my broad categories are going to be low mass stars. So that's going to be stars kind of like the sun, maybe a little bit lower in mass, um, maybe about twice the mass of the sun. You'd be a little bit more likely to find Jupiter mass planets, but particularly for Earth-like planets, probably solar mass are a little bit lower. And this is going to be in contrast to high mass stars. So for me, that's going to be things that are at least, uh, say, 10 times the mass of the sun, things that will end their lives as supernova explosions. These will also have much shorter lives. But during those short lives, um, these will burn very, very bright. So we know um, that the luminosity of, star, of a star goes something like its mass to the 3.5 uh, power. So if you take a star that's, I think, what, twice the mass of the sun, it's going to be at least 10 times as luminous. So if you have a few high mass stars around, you have an incredible amount of radiation that can make a real mess of things in your star forming region. So that's going to have a profound local effect and, of course, uh, profound effects on the galactic scale. Uh, so when we're thinking about then uh, an ecosystem of stars, we're thinking about stars of all these masses and how they, they live together. Uh, so an IMF is going to tell us that we'll have relatively fewer high mass stars, but we'll have lots and lots of low mass stars forming uh, in a high mass star forming region. And so if we go out and look at um, sort of the distribution of how stars are forming together, we can observe a cluster mass function that goes something as n to the minus two. And what this implies is that at least half of the stars uh, that are forming uh, in a Milky Way-like system or in some of the nearby galaxies that we've observed, at least half those stars are forming in star forming regions that are at least as massive as Orion. And you can immediately see what that might mean for the star forming environment. Uh, we now have a wealth of beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope showing us how the high mass stars will light up the gas in these regions, uh, giving us these very picturesque H2 regions. Um, but I like this particular image because you can also see some postage stamps on uh, top of the image of the H2 region, looking at um, the planet forming disks around low mass stars that are also being lit up by these high mass stars. These are the famous proplids, the photo evaporating proto protoplanetary disks. And in this case, we can very literally see the impact of the high mass stars on the low mass star formation that's happening in the same region. Um, so we can see that impact in images, and we can see that if we start looking at the properties of the circumstellar disks themselves, say, by looking at their um, millimeter continuum emission. So the disks in Orion are this red line here, and uh, those are compared to a few other local star forming regions that don't necessarily have high mass stars. So as a counterpoint, something like Taurus, relatively famous uh, low mass star forming region. And one of the conclusions of this paper is that the disks in um, Orion and the ONC are smaller in their physical size and lower in mass when compared to other uh, star forming regions that don't have high mass stars. And just as a point of comparison while we're on that plot, just to highlight where HL tau would fall uh, on this plot, HL tau, again, that famous ALMA image, uh, just to highlight that some of our nearest and best examples of what planet forming disks look like aren't necessarily representative of what most planet forming disks look like. And in fact, HL tau is not that representative what disks look like in Taurus. So if we wanna think about um, sort of the true um, environments where planets are forming, we need to look to bigger environments um, and maybe think about the complexity of how all these pieces fit together. So I'd argue we'd need to um, think about this more in terms of an ecosystem instead of just looking um, at a few spectacular disks uh, as we can do in Orion. And if we consider an ecosystem, we also can um, maybe take a broader horizon as to when we're thinking about planet formation. So not just at this relatively later stage where we had these exposed disks sitting in an H2 region, um, but maybe think about the earlier stages too, especially as more evidence is pointing towards planet formation happening early, or at least beginning early. So when I'm talking about an ecosystem, I'm talking about not only high and low mass stars living alongside each other, but the fact that there's still gas and dust around. And if we consider all of that stuff, um, looking in this case at the uh, Carina star forming region, we can see um, the um, illuminated gas in the H2 region in this uh, bright multicolor image. We can see that there's quite a bit of dust left over that's kind of um, most prominent in the edges of this image, but we can see sort of walls of dust and pillars sticking out. Um, in addition to all the stars, right? So if you have um, remnant gas and dust, that's gonna change your gravitational potential for the um, evolution of the clusters. 
that can shield your planet forming disks from the uh, intense radiation of the many, many high mass stars in a region like Carina. And if we think about all these moving parts together, then you know, what does that mean for the planet forming disks? But if you wanna move to these um, more uh, massive regions, so uh, there are at least 10 times as many high mass stars in a region like Carina compared to a region like Orion, you have to make a trade-off. They're more distant, right? So uh, a region like Carina is at about 2.3 kiloparsecs. So what is that? Four to five times further away than Orion. So then you have the question of, of where do you look and how? How do you start studying the disks in this kind of truly high mass star forming region? So one option would be to go look at um, candidate proplates, candidate um, evaporating disks in a region like Carina and see if you could do a similar study, measure their uh, millimeter dust emission to start measuring the properties of the disks. Um, and Mesa Delgado et al. tried to do just this, looking at some of the candidate proplids in the Trumpler 14 cluster here on the right of this image, um, and could only set upper limits of about seven Jupiter masses for these disks sitting out exposed in the H2 region. So, okay, so maybe disks are evaporated very, very quickly in these very intense environments. Uh, we would also want to consider disks that are still embedded in their natal clouds and start um, observing their properties and trying to characterize uh, how they compare to say local regions that are less dominated by feedback. But again, you have the challenge of where do you look? Because at these greater distances, uh, if you're surveying with say a single dish millimeter telescope, you're contending with a 30 arc second beam. We can see in these sort of high resolution um, HST images, there's gonna be lo a lot within that beam. And particularly if you're looking for low mass stars in these kinds of regions, the low mass stars most likely to host planets, uh, they're probably going to uh, be diluted within this beam and perhaps confused with other things. So we kind of need a different approach if we wanna be looking for low mass stars in these uh, prototypical high mass star from the regions. Uh, and to do so, we can make use of the fact that uh, we kind of have, um, a different environment and therefore different wavelength data is going to give us different information. So if we think about how stars uh, tend to form, we have a lot of observational evidence that tells us that um, disk accretion is often accompanied by the driving of a protostellar jet. About one to 10% of the um, amount of material that would otherwise accrete onto the star can be lost into these protostellar outflows uh, that are bipolar outflows driven at high speeds and can reach relatively um, large or yeah, long distances on the sky. So up to parsec scale lengths. So what this means is that you have um, a physically large feature that's going to be easier to detect at larger distances. That is a pretty compelling signpost that you underlying the system have a accreting circumstellar disk, the same um, region where you expect planet formation to be happening, giving you a pretty good idea where you would want to look to start studying disks. So looking in a region like Carina for these sort of um, protostellar jets was my PhD thesis. So just to highlight uh, one example here, um, what we see in this uh, image from HST is, is a jet driven by a star, um, but it's lit up because it's sitting next to all of these very bright high mass stars that are just blasting it with ionizing radiation. Uh, and so I would argue, and I, I did argue in my thesis that what this is is just the standard um, kind of protostellar jet that you would expect to see in most star forming regions, but it looks different basically because it has better stage lighting. So it's being lit up by those uh, nearby high mass stars. So we can look at these jets in multiple different wavelengths um, and characterize their physical properties, measure their velocities, lots of fun things to do if you're a jet aficionado. But I would also argue that by using this um, high resolution data from the Hubble Space Telescope, you also have a very good idea where you expect your circumstellar disk to be in these jet driving systems. Uh, so I was quite excited to see uh, that Mesa Delgado et al, in addition to looking at the Perplids and Trumpler 14 uh, did exactly this. They were looking at the base of a jet for evidence of the circumstellar disk uh, around the protostar that would be driving this jet. And as you can see, even with the Alma long baseline campaign, uh, this is a pretty challenging observation. So the, um, I would call this disk maybe marginally resolved compared to the size of the beam. But nevertheless, you have pretty good constraints on this system. You have a jet telling you not only the orientation of the system, but some measure of the, the tilt compared to the plane of the sky. 
uh, allowing you to be reasonably confident that when you see this kind of spatially resolved emission, that you're probably looking at a circumstellar disk, um, even though it would appear to be only marginally resolved. So this is the kind of game that I want to play, looking not only for the disks in the region, but also considering these sort of star forming cocoons that they're still in and what this means for the survival of these disks. So I'm going to play a similar game, but I'm going to be on the other side of this um, image of the Carina star forming complex right next to Trumpler 16. Uh, so this is a system we've affectionately been calling the tadpole. Uh, I guess for obvious morphological reasons, you can see there's this dark, um, dusty head in this uh, weird crinkly tail coming out. You see these in silhouette against the bright H2 region. Um, it turns out there's something else called the tadpole. So this was my mistake. Uh, forgive me for uh, keeping the nickname. So we can see this sort of tadpole shaped globule. And again, another bright jet coming out of this globule that's been lit up by all of these high mass stars of Trumpler 16 that's right nearby. And so what we want to do uh, is take this system and basically put the pieces together. So we can see that the high mass stars are nearby. We want to measure exactly how much feedback is incident on this little star and planet forming system. And then what are the consequences for the star forming system that we know has to be in this tadpole globule? And we know it has to be there because again, we see this jet. So step one, quantifying the feedback incident on this little globule, we obtained MUSE observations, giving us basically a spatially resolved uh, measure of the ionized gas and the properties of the globule. Uh, so this is integral field unit spectroscopy, so an image where every point is also a spectrum, allowing us to, again, diagnose physical properties in a spatially resolved way. So if you're a jet aficionado, as I am, we can do this and measure changes um, along the jet axis of the density, the temperature, uh, and particularly the ionization. So we see here um, more or less what you would expect if you have a jet that's um, shot out into an H2 region and then spends a while in an H2 region getting more and more ionized with time so that we can see gas that's further away from the globule is more highly ionized. The longer gas is in the H2 region, the more highly ionized it is. So that's one gratifying for the interpretation of ionized jets. And two, I think is pretty compelling evidence that this um, system is definitely feeling the impact of the nearby high mass stars. Uh, again, we have um, information about the physical properties at every point, but um, to highlight the properties of the globule, just taking a slice kind of in the perpendicular direction, we can play the same game, measure the density in the globule, measure the temperature, um, and measure the ionization of the globule, giving us, again, a measure of the physical properties of the source, um, particularly the ionized gas. And we can use these to calculate things like the photo evaporation rate, how much stuff is there and how long is this going to last um, under the influence of these nearby high mass stars. And we calculate a surprisingly long time scale for the material in this globule to be completely photo evaporated by the nearby high mass stars, about 4 million years before it's completely ablated if photo evaporation is the only thing acting. Now, 4 million years is a relatively long time compared to the time scale of planet formation. We have good evidence that there might be planets um, relatively well developed within a million years. So this was a little bit of a surprise. But nevertheless, this globule is sitting uh, in the middle of an H2 region that is still clearly being affected by the high mass stars nearby. And the question then becomes, how much does the star that must be forming in this globule that's driving this jet actually care about its heart, um, harsh environment. And to do that, we really want to peer inside of this little globule uh, with Alma so that we can get all the way to that driving source, which has not been seen at shorter wavelengths, uh, hopefully probe the properties of the circumstellar disk and start to put these pieces together. Um, so, uh, even without going to the long baseline campaign, we were able to get AMA observations with angular resolution that's comparable to HST in order to do justice, look inside the globule. Um, for me, it's a little bit hard to overstate how exciting this is to go basically a factor of 300 better than the best that we could do prior to ALMA at looking at a system like this. Um, so to just sort of step through some of the things that were really exciting to discover when we could finally spatially resolve um, a relatively small system at the distance of a truly high mass star forming region. Uh, we see a few things that aren't surprising. For example, this um, tadpole shaped globule that we only see in silhouette is where the molecular gas is detected uh, in this tadpole head and in the tail. 
um, we detect a molecular outflow uh, inside this tadpole-shaped globule um, that perfectly lines up with the ionized sort of outflow that we see outside of the shape of this tadpole. This was, again, really gratifying to see because this is exactly the picture you would expect if you have um, standard outflow physics operating, but uh, basically with better stage lighting, right? You have what looks like a molecular outflow when you have enough material around to protect your outflow and maintain the uh, material in molecular form. And then as soon as you're outside of the protection of the globule, that outflow is ionized and we only see that in H alpha. Uh, so quite excited to see um, this nice molecular outflow uh, connecting with the larger ionized jet. We had um, plenty other surprises with the data. So if we were just looking um, at the molecular emission associated with uh, the tadpole head, um, we noticed that our, uh, we used our optically thick lines to try and measure the brightness temperature uh, over the globule to get a sense of how the temperature of the gas might be changing. And while I would be careful um, making any statements about absolute temperature, uh, I think we can reasonably confidently argue that we have evidence that the surface of this globule is hotter than the center of the globule. We see um, brighter brightness temperatures near the edges of the globule and lower temperatures towards the, southern, the center. Again, to be uh, cautious making temperature uh, arguments with uh, the CO brightness temperature alone, but we actually have multiple lines of evidence um, that the surface of the globule is hotter than the center of the globule. So we certainly have an ionization front on the surface of the globule. We have evidence uh, that the molecular gas is hotter. And we have multiple lines of evidence suggesting uh, that actually near this um, protostar driving the outflow, that the gas in the dust remains cold, suggesting that we have a positive radial temperature gradient. So if we just look at the continuum emission detected around the driving source, so here I'm just showing the red and blue lobes of the outflow, the continuum here is in black and gray contours. I will note that it's uh, intriguingly flattened, but I will not go so far as to call this a disk. Um, if we're looking at the continuum emission and trying to um, model its temperature, uh, or sort of model the um, continuum emission, our best fitting models require lower temperatures, temperatures of about 15 Kelvin, in order to match the continuum emission that we observe around this driving source. So we have evidence that the um, gas and dust near the protostar remains cold uh, in the dust. We also have evidence that the gas near the protostar is cold when we look at the chemistry of the gas. So we went searching for um, SIO emission, trying to chase the jet coming out of HH900 uh, here, and we did not detect any SIO emission. But quite accidentally, in the same spectral window, we did detect DCN, a deuterated molecule that's going to be um, more likely to be abundant in colder gas, especially where CO has frozen out of the gas phase. So that's the color scale emission that we're looking at here. Again, the contours of the continuum, excuse me, the white contours of the continuum emission. And I've just put one contour showing the red and uh, blue shifted lobes of the outflow. So we see uh, a deuterated molecule um, close to the continuum emission, close to the source driving this protostellar outflow, suggesting that even though the surface of the globule is quite warm, the gas and dust near this protostar uh, remains quite cold or at least was cold in the relatively recent past. So we have a situation here where we've got a um, globule sitting in the middle of an H2 region. It's hot on the surface. It's cold in the middle. Uh, we would then want to look for kinematic evidence of how the environment is affecting this globule. Uh, is there signs that the globule itself is collapsing, helping drive the um, accretion onto this protostar and help drive this outflow? Is there evidence that this globule is collapsing, um, perhaps pushed to be collapsing at a faster or higher rate because of how it's being pushed by its environment? So there are a couple of different ways um, that you can look for collapse. For example, you can look at the line profiles, um, assuming that say this tadpole is collapsing in a spherical fashion. Um, so if you have some sort of, temp if you have some temperature gradient uh, uh, in the system and a density gradient, you might expect to create a line profile in optically thick lines that is asymmetric um, with a brighter blue peak and a uh, less bright red peak indicating infalling gas onto the source. This kind of low profile might also result from protostellar outflows. We'll want to look at um, 
a line like 13 CO that's less affected by the outflow emission to see if we see this kind of line asymmetry indicative of infalling gas uh, or collapsing gas in this globule. So uh, I'm showing here the contours from the jet in the 12 CO, but again, we use the 13 CO, so it's less affected uh, by the outflow. Uh, and find that the line profiles across the globule, and in fact, in um, all three of our CO isotopologues, are frustratingly symmetric, giving us no particular evidence of collapse in the line profiles. Uh, so for better or for worse, then, with our spatially resolved data, we have another way to approach the question of whether or not this globule is collapsing. So we can actually go, oops. There we go. Um, and try and make a position velocity diagram to understand how the gas is moving as a function of position across the globule. So I'm just gonna take a slice here perpendicular to the direction of the outflow again, so that it has minimal impact uh, on the velocities that we're seeing. And what we get is this, which is a strange kind of C-shaped thing that looks like something straight out of Star Trek. And we've done a lot of scratching our heads trying to understand exactly what this uh, position velocity diagram indicates. Um, so there have been arguments that this kind of C-shaped morphology is evidence of um, inflow into high mass star forming regions. You could um, also make a compelling argument that this C-shaped velocity traces outflow or say um, maybe a wind coming off of this kind of globule. But when we try to model this in detail, neither uh, infall or outflow really explains the shape of this um, feature. So it remains um, a little bit of a mystery exactly what's going on here uh, with these sort of complex internal kinematics that show up in um, all of our isotopologues, but are not broadly consistent with evidence for this system collapsing. So there are a few different possibilities of uh, what's going on here, possibly that it's just in a post-collapse phase and we've got um, a lot going on on the globule. So the one other kinematic thing that we would want to consider is the motion of this globule in the context of its larger star forming region. So the gas velocities that we measure uh, of this tadpole are blue shifted compared to the systemic velocity of the Carina region, suggesting that it not only lies a little bit in the front uh, of the region, but also kind of inviting the question why. Uh, why is it maybe moving towards the observer. So trying to think about um, how the environment might be affecting sort of the, the overall uh, kinematics of the globule kind of invites the question of what the feedback from the high mass stars may have had to do with that. So one thing to think about is that um, high mass stars, of course, their ionizing radiation will push on the gas. And one prediction of that is that it will set it into motion. So the cartoon version of that is this, right? Um, this circle then is like our tadpole globule. Uh, so we've got the radiation coming in from the nearby high mass stars. So what that's gonna do is create an ionization front on, on the surface of the globule. So you've got material streaming away uh, as it's ionized off the surface of the globule. So you've got a wind coming off the globule. Momentum's conserved, so you've got material um, with mass and velocity leading in one direction and actually driving a shock in the other direction. Uh, so not only could this drive the globule to collapse in sort of a radiatively driven implosion scenario, it should also accelerate the globule so that it's moving away from you the sources of the ionizing radiation with time while it's also collapsing and forming a star. So these sorts of ideas about radiatively driven implosion have been uh, suggested for regions like Carina, where you certainly have plenty of radiation around and you have um, evidence uh, that the gas on the sort of edges of this image has certainly been carved by that radiation. So the question is, do say some of these dust pillars that we see at the bottom, do they represent actually the triggering of star formation because ionizing radiation has actually pushed them uh, to form these pillars and stimulated the formation of stars that are often seen at the tips of these pillars. I've always been um, a little bit skeptical of some of these ideas um, because one of the big arguments for triggered star formation has been that I see a star that's near a bunch of ionized gas, but it's a star in dense gas that is forming. But stars form in dense gas, and I think it can be difficult to tell exactly uh, what came first. 
And I say that as a person who grew up in the desert southwest of the United States. So I spent a long time looking at um, desert landscapes, places uh, where we see very clearly the effects of water erosion. So for example, this um, image of Monument Valley in Utah, showing us these sort of these buttes that look, I would say, quite a bit like some of the dust pillars that we see in these high mass star forming regions. But what's happening in the case of the buttes in Monument Valley is you've got higher density cap rock that's protecting lower density material behind it from erosions. You can see the places where the high density rock has protected and between those places where um, the desert has been eroded further and further away. So you can make a similar argument in a star forming region that you have a high density, perhaps where a star would have formed anyways, that's protecting material behind it from erosion. So your dust pillars just reflect erosion and not necessarily the triggering of star formation. So this is a debate that's been going on for a while. Um, but one of the things um, our collaborator Tom pointed out is that the motion of gas in the uh, star forming region is one of the ways to start to tell these things apart. Um, because the ionizing radiation is expected not only to drive, um, say, a globule like the tadpole to collapse, but should also be accelerating it away from the sources of ionizing radiation. So we have some evidence that this might be happening for the tadpole because it is slightly blue shifted compared to the velocity of Carina and maybe more blue shifted than you can just explain with say turbulent velocity dispersion. But we actually have another piece of evidence that this might be uh, exactly what happened with the tadpole because we have the jet providing us um, a bit more of a historical record. So the cartoon picture is this. We've got the blue stars here representing Trumpler 16. I've got these uh, arrows pointing uh, all of their winds and radiation and their feedback on this tadpole system, which is just in this case, uh, a star in a cloud with this jet that we spatially resolve. So the ionized outflow and jet here uh, in black is the ionized jet and outflow that we see in the tadpole. And one of the mysteries about this system has been if you just try to figure out exactly what the jet axis is. So if I just draw a line through this, You'll notice that a line that goes through the inner part of the jet does not necessarily go through the bow shocks. Material that was ejected um, longer ago from the um, protostar. And in particular, the offset of this material is actually closer to the ionizing sources. So there are examples of bent jets in other regions with high mass stars. For example, there are many bent jets in Orion, but many of those jets bend away as though they've been um, pushed back in a headwind from the truly the winds of the stars or pushed back by the radiation of the stars. That's not what we're seeing here. In fact, this looks to be bending toward the high mass stars. And exactly why that is has been a bit of a puzzle, but one of the things Tom pointed out was that if your star is slowly moving away from your high mass sources, you would expect exactly this kind of bend that it looks like things ejected longer ago are closer to the high mass stars. And if we measure the offset from what looks to be the jet axis of those bow shocks and the current jet axis, uh, we estimate about the same recession velocity as we measure uh, from the blue shift of the system. Which puts me in that uncomfortable position of being a little bit skeptical of these uh, models of like a star being triggered by feedback from high mass stars and perhaps actually having evidence uh, that the star forming in the tadpole shaped globule was in fact triggered by the feedback from the nearby high mass stars. So this is one very detailed and I would argue very spectacular example of what we're trying to do on a much larger scale. So the cartoon version uh, is this, that we have um, an ongoing survey looking at different amounts of ionizing radiation incident on um, different kinds of star forming interfaces. So we wanna measure the input feedback with mu's and then um, compare that to the physical properties in the cold molecular and star forming gas by looking at it with ALMA. So I'm part of a survey that's led by Pam Klassen at the UK Astronomy Technology Center that's been looking at a number of different star forming pillars in the Carina region uh, with the ALMA in using the ACA in standalone mode. So the targets of this survey are mostly shown here um, in black boxes with um, colored contours of the gas. Overplotted on this are dots showing the O and B type stars color coded by their radial velocity. To, um, since we're looking here at a larger slice of a Herschel image, just to give you a sense, the um, mosaic from the Hubble Space Telescope that we were just looking at is roughly this rectangle here in the middle. 
So we were just looking at um, the tadpole shaped globule that's sitting kind of right in this central region. Um, again, many of these pillars are on the outskirts. What I want to talk about now is one that's actually um, much closer to these central clusters and getting about an order of magnitude more ionizing feedback than um, some of the pillars in the outskirts. And then finally, just to mention for um, fellow aficionados of looking at the impact of feedback on gas, there was a really nice paper doing um, similar things, looking at how feedback um, differing by about an order of magnitude impacts star forming gas in Karina from um, David Rebollado that came out in 2020. So I encourage you to take a look if this is uh, in your wheelhouse as well. But what I want to talk about at the moment is the so-called mystic mountains. So um, the image might be familiar to many people. This was the target of the Hubble 20th anniversary um, image campaign. I have oriented it in the opposite direction that you usually see it because I like to put north up and east to the left. And I've highlighted here the three very famous protostellar jets that are seen in this image, HH901 here at the bottom, HH902 and HH1066. And again, Trumpler 14, one of those big um, clusters of high mass stars is um, about a parsec in projection off the bottom of this image. So looking at these um, jets as part of my thesis, we started thinking also a little bit about the driving sources of those jets. And one of the things that we quickly noticed is uh, comparing to surveys uh, in the infrared looking for young stellar objects, we really only detected one of the three jet driving sources in this complex in the infrared. So that's HH1066, the one that is furthest away from the ionizing sources in this particular complex. And it turned out to sort of be true in, in the broader survey too, especially for sources very close to those ionizing, um, those high mass stars and all of their ionizing radiation. We kind of had one of two situations. Either the star was completely bare and you could see it in the H alpha image there in the H2 region, or we couldn't see it at all in the infrared images. Uh, so there may be, um, some issues with uneven sensitivity of the infrared images, but nevertheless, it was suspicious that the closer you are to the ionizing sources, um, the less likely we were to detect the driving sources of the jet in the infrared. So one of the things that we wondered was, is the feedback from those high mass stars actually helping compress the gas um, in the vicinity of these jet driving sources, much like we saw with the tadpole and perhaps obscuring them from view? So what this would mean is that you would only be able to detect the driving sources of these other two jets with ALMA. So I was quite pleased to see Giovanni Cortez Rangal do exactly this, um, going with ALMA and detecting um, the driving source and these beautiful molecular outflows from HH901 here on the left and HH902. So in both cases, you can see there's a detection of a continuum source. There's a very beautiful molecular outflow. Again, in both cases, you can see uh, the molecular emission basically stops at the edge of the pillar. Outside of that, it's simply too hot for molecules to survive. Uh, I'll argue that's also true for HH902. You can see the red shifted side of the jet ends right at the edge of the pillar. Uh, and the blue shifted side of the jet appears to stop right where we actually see the jet leaving the pillar uh, in the optical images. So again, um, really nice to see these molecular outflows joining up with the ionized jets that you see once they're out in the H2 region. And so one of the things that I hope we'll be able to collaborate on is actually sort of starting to put these pieces together. So looking at the um, large scale um, structure of the gas and how the properties of the gas are changing as a function of distance from those ionizing sources and connecting that to what that means for these uh, protostars forming within this environment. So again, the, the larger strategy here is trying to sample um, different ionizing feedback and uh, looking at different sources, um, in particular through this survey in Karina, where we've looked at a number of different star forming pillars. You could argue that's um, a targeted survey of a region that in some ways is relatively old. Star formation in Karina has been going on for at least 3 million years, probably closer to five. There's some good evidence that there's been at least one supernova. So what we'd really like to do is also um, more or less the same thing, looking at a younger region in a more contiguous fashion. So I'd argue M17 is a great place to do this. Um, so we've got this um, cluster of stars illuminating the H2 region that's very similar to Trumpler 14 in, um, in the Carina region, but M17 is much younger, roughly only a million year old, um, and it's unambiguously before pre-supernova feedback.
So we've got this um, bright H2 region, lots of ionizing photons lighting up this nice um, dust wall, this interface, lots of ongoing star formation. Uh, and in this case, accidentally beautifully matching the morphology of the simulation from Jim Dale, again, looking at the impact of ionizing radiation on the gas. So the idea here is to do much as we um, did for the tadpole globule and much as we are doing for the other pillars in Carina is to go and map um, the interface between the ionized gas and the molecular gas with mu's so that we can actually connect what the high mass stars are doing, um, the input feedback on the gas, and then look at that same portion with ALMA so that we can start to see how that impacts the um, properties of the molecular and star forming gas. So I'm pleased to say that um, both of these surveys have been awarded. Um, at this point, the observations are done, and we are now um, trying to wrangle this very large data set. So please stay tuned. I look forward to sharing these results with you in the hopefully not too distant future. So that's um, sort of a large scale view of um, building on what we're doing in Karina, again, just sampling um, the variations of how feedback is impacting gas uh, in these high mass star forming regions. We looked at this one spectacular example of the tadpole um, globule in Carina and, um, and how it might challenge some of our assumptions about exactly what feedback is doing to star and planet formation. So for example, um, images of disks laid bare in H2 regions would suggest um, that they are destroyed very rapidly. And it would seem that they are when they're outside of the protection of their globule. But in the case of the tadpole, we found a relatively long lifetime for this globule to remain protecting the star and planet forming system. So there's a good chance that this planet, planet forming system may be well developed before it's ever exposed to the very harsh environment that it lives in. So I hope I've convinced you that it's certainly worth um, pushing to higher um, mass star forming regions when we're considering what star and planet formation looks like uh, in general. And I hope I've convinced you that the star forming environment is certainly an important part of the question of how stars and planets form. So with that, I will just put up some conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. So let's see some hands for questions. Okay, Luis Felipe, go ahead. Yes, a very nice, uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. You. With respect to the tan hole, the, the tail, is it part of the outflow or is just uh, sitting there and uh, it's a remain of the formation of the globule? Do you know, do you know that or not? So that's a great question. Um, we are confident that it's not part of the outflow. So I guess, I uh, can see in this image that the red shifted side of the outflow uh, is in the same direction as the tail, which is actually blue shifted um, compared to, um, I guess, the systemic velocity of the tadpole. So I'm not showing it in this image. I think I maybe have it in a backup slide. So the um, velocities are contiguous. It is definitely, oops, there we go. It is definitely associated with the tadpole. Um, it's not associated with the outflow. And we're trying to figure out exactly why it's there and why it's in its squiggly shape. So we played around with some ideas like, is this um, a high density spine left over from a pillar formation? We've thrown a lot, of, a lot of ideas that none quite explain what's going on with this tail. So I can rule things out, but I can't give you a satisfactory uh, explanation. Uh, very happy to hear ideas though. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Luis Felipe. We have uh, Luis. A really fantastic talk. I really enjoy your images, really beautiful. And actually, Luis Felipe already <laughs> said my question. No? And okay. I'm also really interested in the tail, no? because now the people also think that there is some kind of flows coming to the, I mean, to the source. You see in many Star Forming region, this kind of flows, no? and maybe. You have one here, but I don't know, and I'm really no, not really sure. The other question is the really tiny globulets that you see around it. No, I saw in some images that you present that you see the really small things. And my question is about this kind of brown dust formation. I mean, the things that are really small. Do you have more information about these globulets? <laughs> 
so uh, let me see if I've captured the spirit of your question. So is this is this two things? So there are some things that have been seen in silhouette in the Hubble images that have been proposed as like a source of things that will become planet mass objects or brown dwarfs in the environment. This, this. I saw yes. a few in your image of this tangible image. I mean, you see in the south one global that is really thin, and I saw I in some images. This, yeah, maybe. I'm trying the to think about a better one here, but this. it's like right here. Yes. So, so great question. Um, so it turns out this little globula was not in the sample uh, identified just from the Hubble Space Telescope images, but oh. we were able to come up with the mass estimate, and that is actually about a 12 Jupiter mass object. Oh. We don't have. Um, I haven't done much in terms of estimating its stability, but I really appreciate the question because the tadpole itself was identified in this survey of globules seen silhouette in Carina and identified, I think, as like a 14 Jupiter mass object. So we can clearly say that's not accurate, um, both because it's star forming and because we can estimate a mass that's at least a solar mass and, and maybe quite a bit higher than that here. But uh, I think you bring up an interesting point. There are many other such small globules that are not obviously star forming and it's hard to say exactly how massive they are if they are you know 12 jupiter masses how have they survived i think yeah great question yes maybe this is a, i mean it's a nice thing because you you have this kind of flotating planets and around and maybe they are here no i don't know it's, uh, yeah it's, <laughs> yeah it's a question i think you yeah, um, what is the fate of those things too? Yes. Well, really, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Luis. Do we have any questions from the auditorium? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thanks, Megan, for the talk. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I'm Roberto Galvan. Yeah. Uh, Hi. I, I have a. Um, can you show this image of um, where you show the the bow shocks? At large scale, and then the the jet and the, at the intermediate scale, and then the globule as well. Where you actually were, were, were emphasizing that if you draw a line, uh, there are offsets between the yeah. Is that one? Uh, okay. Did you did you quantify? Uh, it looks to me like there could be sort of proper motion and tracers. Like if you draw a line between the bow shocks. And the line that you already have drawn for the jet, and then you draw a line for the inner globule, like there is a successive offset between features uh, uh, that probably you could interpret as proper motions and, and looks to me consistent with your acceleration um, of the globule scenario. Yes. Did, you to, did you try to quantify that or? or, or uh, yes. Um, so exactly as you suggested, we were trying to measure um, where a line that bisects the bow shocks would be, where for the jet and for the globule, um, and then using the dynamical age of the jet, try to figure out what that recession velocity would be. Um, so modulo large uncertainties, it's roughly 10 kilometers a second, which is consistent with the blue shift relative to the systemic velocity of Carina that we see in the velocity of the gas, um, which, uh, yeah, a lot of hand waving involved in that estimate, but um, surprisingly uh, consistent with the blue shift that we saw in the molecular gas. So we took that as very interesting, but wanted to be cautious about making too strong a claim. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Any other questions from the auditorium? Yes, we have another one. Um, Hello, Megan. Thanks for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, I'm curious about the MUSE data because you are not interested in, well, you will not be able to resolve uh, spectroscopically the, the lines, for example. I don't think MUSE have the spectral resolutions to see any ve ve velocity variations within the clumps. Uh, so I'm interested in why use MUSE instead of using the HST, the available HST data, for example. I don't know if there are enough uh, narrowband images. I see. Sorry. So you're asking um, why use. Um, sorry, let me make sure I understand the second part of your question in terms of resolving the clumps. You mean in terms of measuring proper motions um, of the jet itself or 
Um, no, I mean, my, my point is that Muse, uh, you, you're only showing, for example, images, narrowband images that you produce with Muse, for example, for the other. Thing. Correct. So you, yeah. you don't see, you don't resolve velocity structure within the spectra, for example. You don't see any right. design profiles or. So why go into such trouble to map with Muse <laughs> a very large area of this uh, at the end of this project that you were presenting? instead of just using the available HST data, which are flux calibrated, for example? I guess, so there are uh, two answers to that. So for the tadpole globule itself, uh, it was, I guess, a, a test of how much Muse would serve us for this kind of work, because that's one pointing of Muse, basically. So a quick snapshot image, and then what we get is the spectrum from, what, 4,700 angstroms to 930, 9,350, yeah. something like that. So we have this incredible suite of diagnostic lines um, allowing us to get density, temperature, ionization diagnostics, um, a whole host of jet diagnostics and those sorts of things. Um, so giving us more physical properties of the source. Um, you're right that we could make estimates from the HST image um, for the photo evaporation and other things that does require some assumptions about how you say get to a density that you can directly calculate when you at least have detected say the sulfur two lines with Muse. Um, you're right that the spectral resolution is not uh, exemplary. So we marginally detect the velocity, the radial velocity of the jet with Muse and that's not perfect. But if we're trying to, um, look at this as a system. I did not talk at all about, oops, where's my cursor? This star sitting um, basically on top of the outflow here, but we actually detected this also with Alma in both CO and in the continuum. And anything we would wanna do in terms of trying to get the spectrum of that star and making sure it's say, the same radial velocity, um, signatures of accretion, anything like that requires that we be very careful about how we subtract um, not only the jet, but also the H2 region emission around that. And we've really struggled to do that well with just a slit or certainly with any sort of fiber. So MUSE seems to be the best way to sort of deal in these messy environments and still get good measurements on the point source. If I understand the second part of your question, then looking to a region like M17Y to go for something like MUSE, again, that spectral coverage in terms of giving us that many gas diagnostics, but also pushing us that far red so that we um, can come up with a uniform sample over a pretty big range of extinction. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jesus. Anyone else in the auditorium? No, we're done here. Okay. Uh, anyone who's connected to Zoom? Okay, if not, let us thank our speaker again. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. Cheers. Thank you. Everyone, have a good afternoon. Bye.